from Anna Benz, uh, International Content Program Manager at the Khan Academy. It's so great to have you. Finally, we find some time to, yeah. to, to have a chat. Yeah, um, thank you so much for inviting me. You're a gala champion. You've been uh, a gala member since 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And you've been extremely active uh, in the gala community. You joined uh, a SIG, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, you've taken a, attended a lot of webinars. So, But let's start from the beginning. Um, how did you start out in localization? Well, it was um, a little bit of a, a random thing. I was a product manager. I was working for a nonprofit that built secure human rights documentation software. Mm. And most of our users were outside the US, did not speak English. Um, not that there aren't human rights issues in English speaking countries, but there were more, more of our users were elsewhere. Um, and so I learned about localization because we needed to do it. Um, we needed to have the software and the documentation in multiple languages. And I very quickly figured out that I loved it. And even though I couldn't read all the languages or even understand <laughs> them, it made me so happy to see the software come up in these other languages and know that we were you know, helping with mm -hmm. access for, for people around the globe. And so um, that was something I just really, that was the, my favorite part of my job. and. Uh, and then as I moved into other areas, I always sort of missed that. And so when I was mm -hmm. looking for the next thing, I was like, I would love to do something internationally focused, something localization focused. And um, I was thinking a lot about education as an area of tech I wanted to focus on. So I was sort of looking at both those things. So then to find a role at Khan Academy that was both education and tech and you know localization mm -hmm. internationally focused was sort of the, the dream job. So. Um, yeah. that's, that's how I ended up here. And it's, it's a, an amazing, fun thing. We still, yeah. <laughs> I still get a huge kick out of seeing our site come up in languages I can't read. Um, and, you know, knowing that, that that's expanding access, um, yeah. for, for users all over the world. So. so what is exactly the Khan Academy? Um, so Khan Academy is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we've been around a little over 10 years and, uh, I think, most folks think of us as the math video people because it start, we started exactly. out as being math videos on YouTube, but we've now grown to much more than that. Um, many other subjects other than math, many things other than videos. We have a lot of, you know, if you're gonna really learn something, you have to practice it. So a lot of practice exercises, a lot of, we've started, it used to be very independent learner Mm -hmm. uh, focus, but now we've started working much more with schools and teachers, so building a lot of teacher tools and things like that. Um, and and we provide uh, you know these educational resources for free in over fifty languages. Um, wow. So it's it's a it's a really fun place to work with a bunch of smart people whose hearts are in the right place. <laughs> I always say so. <laughs> That's wonderful. So um, where is the Khan Academy used globally and? Um, and how, basically? Yeah, I would say, so it, we are used in pretty much every country. I mean, over 190 countries uh, we have usage. So used globally, um, used both by independent learners who are just doing it to, mm -hmm. because they want, they search us up and, you know, fi find stuff and also used um, in schools with teachers mm -hmm. assigning things um, with, there's a lot of, uh, the, the main point is really to focus on mastery based learning. So mm -hmm. letting the students go at their own time and pace and move up when they're ready and get extra practice if they need it. Um, and so it's used, you know, differently in different countries. Um, but we do have, uh, you know, users everywhere. And it's really great to see, you know, we've heard a lot of stories, there have been a lot of efficacy studies about how mm -hmm. use of Khan Academy has helped in, in academic achievement. So um, it is we have in some countries we have staff where mm -hmm. we are uh, working directly with schools, sometimes with state or, or local governments or even national governments to mm -hmm. do, in addition to translating the, con the co educational content, we also do a lot of curriculum mapping. So aligning things to the local curriculum so it will be right. really relevant in all of these countries. Um, some countries care more and less about that, but we've done that a, a lot of work um, in that area because we know it's mm -hmm. really important to a lot of folks. Wow. Um, and 50 languages, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's it a is. lot of localization. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, and I would say, I mean, to, to clarify, 
Khan Academy does not do all of that. Um, one of the, the program that I work the most on is what we call our language advocate program. So we partner with organizations around the mm -hmm. world to help with the localization. Um, we do have some staff in certain countries. So Khan Academy has staff in the US and Canada. And then um, we also have uh, offices where we have staff in India, Brazil, and Peru. So mm -hmm. in those countries, it's Khan Academy staff working on the localization. Um, for Spanish, we do not only for Peru, but we actually do Spanish for the US because there are a lot of Spanish speakers of here and yeah. some other countries. Um, and so those languages are, we do in house, but literally all of the rest of them, we partner with these incredible um, language advocate organizations, mostly nonprofits in other countries. Many of them are education nonprofits. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them start out as groups of volunteers who then become uh, become <laughs> organizations. That's how we've had a lot of little Khan Academy created nonprofits in different parts of the world, and and they're really amazing. Um, yeah. They you know it ranges from small groups of people, handful of volunteers, to twenty full time paid staff with five hundred volunteers working on on the localization. And and a lot of these folks do more than just the translation and localization. Like they are doing. They're training teachers, they're doing marketing, they're doing outreach, mm -hmm. they're doing all of the things that we do in the countries where we have staff. So it's a really incredible group of folks. Um, yeah. and, and I'm I'm proud to work with them. It's it's really an amazing. I, I love I love being able to work with people around the world, um, even when I'm just in California. <laughs> so <laughs> really fun. What other challenges are there for localization um, within a nonprofit, apart from finding, of course. Uh, collaborations, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, in general, I think nonprofits in, in general, you know, we are mm. um, funded mostly by philanthropy. So mm -hmm. for us, and I think with any organization, resources are really the biggest thing. I mean, we have all kinds of things we would love to do and we don't have enough. I mean, we have a, we have a very small but mighty international content team. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we don't, mm -hmm. we would love to have <laughs> more more resources more people more funding more all of that um i think that's the biggest challenge um but i mean specific to sort of localization you know obviously in given some of the languages we work with yeah. some of them are um not as commonly used so that the support for them in whatever tech mm -hmm. we're using is not always completely there. Um, you know, something I learned a long time ago, which I think to everyone listening to this would be obvious is like, don't assume that the display is going to work correctly just because it's supposed to, <laughs> right? Like, so it's like, always test it because something weird might happen, especially when you're using languages that are not spoken by as many millions exactly. of people. So, you know, we definitely have some challenges around things like uh, you know, we have we have an amazing team and, in, in, you know, doing Armenian and Georgian and Kazakh and Kyrgyz and lots of, you know, sort of languages where um, maybe Google search doesn't support them or maybe, you know, like they're, they're all different mm -hmm. kinds of things that we use and you assume will just work and they don't. So, I mean, there's always there's always that. <laughs> there's um, always something new. <laughs> yeah, but um, usually we find a way, you know, but, uh, you know, I think that the biggest thing is always just people. We have so many things we want to do and there's not enough time, you know. Yeah. So. So how did you find out about Gala? You know, I was trying to remember when you asked me this, and I don't remember. I mean, I think I was just aware of it from being, you know, I joined, you know, I, as I realized that I really love localization, I joined localization groups on LinkedIn. I joined, you know, I sort of would look for opportunities to, to take webinars and to learn more. Um, and I think Gala just came, kept coming up, right? <laughs> and at a certain point, I was like, okay, well, I want to join and I actually think it would be really useful to other people at Khan Academy because we don't have a dedicated localization group so it's like some of the engineers know about it some of the marketing people know about it you know the content creators in those mm -hmm. languages know about it we have some people who have localization background but not that many and so I was like you know I think one of the things I wanted to do was join as an organizational member so that everyone at Khan Academy mm -hmm. can get access to the resources exactly. because there are a lot of really great resources. So when I see a webinar that I'm like, oh, these engineers would be really interested in that, or this team would be really interested in that, I can share it with everybody. And, and that's been really great to be able to sort of share those resources with other people. Even when I don't have, I mean, I don't, I want to go to more things than I can. And sometimes I watch them later and, you know, but at least I know, you know, I can share it with other people, even if I don't have time to go. So. Well, as a content strategist, you make me very happy. <laughs> 
<laughs> to know that you're always trying to disseminate our yeah. content. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> yeah. But you also joined the client SIG, right? Yeah. What, what, what's your experience with the client SIG, uh, um, with the SIG in general within Gala? Yeah, I mean, what I thought was really interesting, um, I think I'm trying to think of the other one I joined. I think there's an, just an internationalization general one um, yes. that uh, what I like about those specifically is that, you know, they have webinars that are targeted at a particular audience or someone who's interested in a particular thing. And, and I did like the idea of having a SIG where it's just people who are doing the work and it isn't vendors. <laughs> I mean, you know, I love many of the vendors that, <laughs> that are there, but it's nice to have a place where it's people who can, you know, um, just talk about the, okay, how are you addressing this problem and how are you, you know, dealing with this yeah. and, and webinars that are, and, and conversation space where people can ask questions and answer them. Um, that that's that's really nice. Um, and I know for for me, you know, being able to go to uh, different types of of webinars on different topics. Mm -hmm. Like some some of the things I'm interested in are more sort of strategic kind of you know how do you make globalization a bigger part of an organizational strategy versus some of it is very specific about you know how do you do how do you implement right to left you know like so, <laughs> exactly. so right i mean like there's all these different like there are levels of things that you can um learn about and some of it is i'm just interested and some of it is specific to the work mm -hmm. that we're doing and um so you know it's 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 really great to have sort of a variety of of topics and so having that Right. Um, let's talk accomplishments. Um, the professional accomplishment you're most proud of. Oh, gosh. I mean, I think for us, you know, uh, I mean, recently anyway, um, we did in, in 2020, we hit 50 languages. That felt like a big milestone. Actually, at the end of 2021, we we launched four more language sites, actually six language sites over the year, four at the end of the year, like the end of 2021 was very busy. We were trying to launch um, four new languages. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really a, I mean, it sounds like, oh, we did this in 2021, but it's many, many years of work of the teams working on translating because yeah. we say, you know, you have to translate a lot of content before you get a site. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of work that goes into it. Um, I think, you know, what happened, I mean, in, I think everybody, you know, 2020 was a strange year for everyone. 2021 definitely <laughs> continued to be a strange year. But in 2020, what happened a lot for us was, um, you know, we have, these are, you know, the, the language advocates that we work with are not employees. We don't give them deadlines. We say, work at your own pace. Whenever you're ready, we'll be here to help mm -hmm. you launch the site. Um, we'll support you along the way. Um, but people go at their own pace. So in 2020, when schools started to shut down, a lot of languages who had been going at a relatively, you know, they've been working, but you know, at their own pace, they kicked into high gear because they're like, wow. people desperately need this because school closures and a lot of, yes. you know, some, some schools are giving support and some schools are not. And, and there's such a need for this. So, I mean, there always was a need and we were always there, but in 2020, a lot of languages kicked into high gear <laughs> and started translating at a really high speed. Um, so in 2020 and 2021, we launched a lot of new languages and that's, that's really, um, that's yeah. really been amazing. And then for us also getting more languages in our mobile apps, um, because a lot of countries, you know, are mobile first, or you might not have internet access on a computer at home, but you have a mobile device. And so exactly. a lot of it is really just about access, um, to the educational materials and, and, um, you know that every every time we launch a new site i get excited so um but but you know 50 was a big number so absolutely <laughs> absolutely a, you know. what's the next uh, language pair that you're going to launch or you're working on can we I know don't, or i don't know not? i mean i don't know because um you know we have many other we have probably have another 10 or 15 languages that haven't launched yet that are working on it um and i don't know who will be next i mean i have i have some maybe ideas but i don't know you know i never know until the last you know, sometimes someone will come to me and be like we're ready and i'm like okay okay because, because i can't track them all right i mean I, you know like it's i i don't stay on top of every single one um i wish i had time for that uh but <laughs> usually i wait for them to tell me they're getting close and then and then we then and we then start you push the button and then go live exactly yeah so you know we'll we'll see i i mean you know keep I, us posted yeah, i will for sure yeah <laughs> and you mentioned that the Khan academy was you know, in the beginning, at least, um, known for the math material, etc. What are the other most popular subjects right now? 
Um, science has become really, really popular both in, in the US and internationally. Um, but I would say it varies a little bit by country what the need course, is. Yeah. You know, we've we've definitely usually people will launch their site with early math, you know, elementary mm -hmm. school math because it's easier, everyone needs it. It's the basis for all the things that come later. Exactly. But we don't require that. We're like, look, if you think in your country that there's a need for biology or something else, um, you can start with that. And so we've definitely had had countries say, oh, you know, really, we need computer science or we really need mm -hmm. middle, you know, high school chemistry or something, you know I mean? Like, so there'll be, um, I would say that math and science are where we have the most content and where we mm -hmm. have the sort of the, the richest amount of content. And so, um, you know, that's usually what people start with because there's the most to, to work on. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have humanities. Uh, we have, you know, a, a lot of people really love our art history classes and there's, you know, sort of world history and, and um, there are Pixar, we, we, part, we do a little bit of partnering with other people for content creation. So we've done some sort of storytelling uh, mm -hmm. courses, partnering with Disney and Pixar and other places like that. We have, um, you know, there, there are a bunch of, of folks that uh, have other things outside of math and science, either mm -hmm. that we've created or that we've partnered with. And, and people love those courses too. There's just not as much of the content as there is in math and science. Um, and we also, I mean, for, for we, this we don't localize, but um, we have, uh, we're official partners with the SAT, which, um, you know, most colleges in the U.S. require mm -hmm, for yes. entry, though that's changing all the time, but, um, but that, uh, and so that's free SAT practice, which has really, you know, shown a lot of um, uh, help for folks who, you know, can't afford to hire a tutor, but um, exactly. can get that free practice. Um, so that's super popular, but in English. Um, and another thing that is super popular is we have an early literacy app called Khan Academy Kids that is about early numeracy and early uh, literacy in English only right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of there's lots of interest <laughs> in having it in other languages. We're not there yet. Hopefully someday. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Oh, I'll keep us posted because it yeah. sounds really really interesting. Um, yeah. So for those who want to start out in localization, what's your uh, best tip? What's your best advice? Oh gosh, um, I don't. I don't know. Like for me, I mean, yes, there's certainly there are programs academically you can take around translation, mm -hmm. localization, interpretation, all these things, right? There, there are lots of programs like that. Um, but I think, like for me, I came into it completely randomly, uh, you know, as doing doing tech work and being a product <laughs> manager and having users in other countries and just needing right. to do it. So I think if you have an interest in it, there are a lot of ways to, to find your way into it, whether it's through, um, I mean, it doesn't only have to be through software, right? But I mean, I think a lot of us of get into not. it through software, but probably, um, yes, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I think if there's an interest, uh, you know, you want to, if you are fluent in another language, you can start out translating, learn, learn about it that way. Um, if you're a, if you're more of a software person, you can learn about it that way. And they're taught, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many, you know, sort of self-education courses you can, you can exactly. find whether, you know, I mean, through Gala, through other places, um, there are, there are a lot of ways you can learn about it, but I, I would say for me, I learned the most by just doing it. Um, you know, and, and when I <laughs> talk to other people who, came to it mm -hmm. in different ways, you know, you learn, you learn all the pitfalls and you learn, you know, you're like, oh, I did it this way. Never going to do it that way again. Um, you know, <laughs> or we tried that. That didn't work. OK, remember that for next time. So. Very good advice. Um, so um, what's your source of inspiration? Where do you go to find inspiration? <laughs> oh, gosh, I don't know. That's a hard one. Um, I mean, I think, as I said, I do really I get excited when I am working with folks who are making these resources available to learners mm -hmm. who don't have act, who wouldn't have access in other ways. I think that's really, um, I mean, I used, I did for-profit tech for a long time before I did nonprofit <laughs> tech. And I, at a certain point I realized, you know, I was like, I love, I work with great people. I work on really interesting technical challenges. I'm learning a lot, but at the end of the day, we're helping big companies make more money. And I really want to do something I can care about more and feel like <laughs> I'm doing good for the world in some way. Exactly. And so, you know, and, and that's how I ended up switching into sort of nonprofit tech, but I didn't want to, I love the tech, so I didn't want to leave that behind. And so then, you know, I think that's, that's a huge source of 
know, knowing you're helping in some way, mm -hmm. whatever it is, um, it definitely keeps me motivated. Okay, so Anna Benz, thank you so much. Thank you.